Welcome back to another tech tip, everyone. Mitch here again, back to back, two videos in a row. Let's keep the momentum going. So today I'm talking about something that I'm really excited about, and that is our brand new iSCSI Houston module. So if you go back uh, a few months or a month or two, something like that, I released a video about our new HA iSCSI solution that we developed based on SCST and Pacemaker. And so this is a build on top of that. So we have our framework underneath the hood of how we build our HAI SCSI solution. Now we have a very nice UI wrapper that sits over top of it, which means you, you get to stay out of the command line the whole time. So without further ado, let's jump in. I'm gonna do a demo and we're gonna talk a little bit about what this Houston module is all about and how you can use it today. All right, so before I hop into it, I just want to talk about this a little bit. So our iSCSI module for Houston, as I mentioned, is using the SCST kernel module. This is not the default iSCSI solution in Linux, but we are using it for a whole host of reasons, one of which is stability and performance. Um, so with that being said, today we're going to be showing off our Houston module in a clustered Ceph uh, configuration, which gives us full HA iSCSI solution across multiple nodes. But this also is fully supported and fully works with a single server configuration with, say, ZFS or some other type of RAID underneath the hood. So whichever it is you want to deploy, highly available clustered or single server with Ceph or with something else, we've got your back. But again, today we're going to show off with RBD and iSCSI. So let's dive in right now. All right, guys, so here we are with our new Houston module. It is part of the file sharing module for now. So we can see we see Samba, we see NFS, and of course iSCSI, which we are using today. So the first thing we're going to do before we actually configure our IQN or our iSCSI target is we're going to create a iSCSI LUN. But what's really cool about this module is this will actually create our RBDs for us and will even allow us to stripe our RBDs for additional performance if you want to have multiple RBDs making up one LUN. So without further ado, let's dive into that and let's start doing it now. So the first thing we do is we click on this little plus icon and we give it a new name. So let's call this LUN0. And we can see we have device type block IO. Block IO is the only type we can use when we are using clustered. And if we go down to the very bottom here on our little cog, we can see that clustered is enabled and that's why we don't have access to file IO. If we uncheck this and we do single server, we will see block or file IO as a uh, possibility. Okay. So now that we have LUN0, we could, if we already had an RBD that we wanted to use, we could give us the path to that RBD, and then we would add that in. But us, we want to create a brand new iSCSI LUN out of one or more RBDs. So we can see we have the add manage RBDs down here. We click the plus one more time. And so we use LVM. Uh, even if we're only doing a single RBD, we still use LVM as it's part of our uh, pacemaker failover cluster. Uh, and the reason why you would do something like this is rather than using the RBD name of like dev RBD zero, that could be different from one node to another. If another node already has an RBD mapped, if it's RBD zero on this node and it fails over to this node, well, it's going to increment up by one. So it might be RBD one on this side. So that would cause some contention and some issues. So we need to make sure that that never happens. So we're always going to be using our LV names, not the RBD names themselves and how they get mapped into the host. So let's give it an LV of iSCSI LUN 0, and then we get to select the pool. So we can see in this case we have the ability to do RBD, which is a three rep pool, or if we wanted to use erasure coding, we could add a data pool and add RBD erasure coding. So we could add the data actually going to an erasure coded pool and the parent pool being the three rep pool. Now if you're doing any low latency workloads, high performance workloads that aren't really throughput based, and more uh, IOP based, uh, we're definitely going to recommend replication all day for running virtual machines and things like that. Your mileage may vary on what you can get away with with an erasure coding pool, but for sure, if we look at the two, replication is going to perform better for that use case. So we've got a three rep pool. Now we get to get, select the size. Let's just give it a 
1,000 Gibby bytes, or we could just go one Tebby byte uh, like that. All right, so now we can see how many RBDs do we want to split this across if we want to do striping. So we could say, let's stripe that across four RBDs. So now to be 250 gigabytes per RBD, striped all together using LVM, and we get some additional aggregate performance by using the striping of four RBDs. So let's click Create. And it's now under the hood creating it. And there we go. So we can see iSCSI LUN 0 is here. It's made up of four RBDs. And it's 1.1 terabyte, not tebibyte. So click plus, And that is now added into the infrastructure. OK. So now let's click on plus, And let's start creating our IQN, our actual uh, iSCSI target that we're going to use uh, for this server. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to create a name for IQN. So IQN.2024. Uh, 11, it's the 11th month, dot com, dot 45 drives, dot test, iSCSI. That's a simple name, just a test name that we can have. Now we're going to select the portal IP address. So this is going to be our virtual IP address that is going to move between hosts. Now if this was non-clustered, you would use the physical IP address of the host. But in the cluster configuration, you can't do that because you need the IP to fail between hosts. And that's why we're going to use a virtual IP. All right, so for our virtual IP, let's ping an IP and make sure we can, uh, that it doesn't have a host already associated with it. So let's try 168.6.20. Okay, looks like that is not in use, so that's what we'll use. 168.6.20. Now, if we wanted to use multipath IO iSCSI, which many people probably will want to, we can do that. And I'll show you how just a little bit here. But first, we're going to create our IQN, our new target, with that information in place. And there we go. So now we click on our little wrench here, and we can actually do additional configuration. So we can see here, if we wanted multiple uh, IP addresses to handle multipath IO, we could add it here. But for this case, for the testing purposes, one portal is totally fine for us. Next, we have our group, our, our initiator group, or our group of initiators that we're going to allow. So let's call it, um, well, it's just called allowed by default. You can change that if you want. And these are the initiators of the clients that are inherently allowed to access the iSCSI target. So we're going to use my desktop uh, in my office. So let's go. I've got a remote desktop here. We're going to go over to the iSCSI properties, and we're going to get my IQN here. And we can see it here. So I'm going to copy it, and we're going to put it in to our new initiator that's going to be allowed to access this configuration. There we go. So now, which LUNs can these initiators access that we have here? So we only have one LUN created. So let's just add our LUN, and we can see it's going to increment up by one each time, but we can start with zero. And we can see, since we only have one LUN created, that's all we see here. So we can just select it, and we click Create. So now that LUN is going to be associated with our uh, initiator group that we have created. So any LUNs that are in there, those group of initiators are going to have access to those LUNs. In this case, it's just the one. So there we go. So that looks really good. Now, if we wanted to use CHAP, um, Authentication Protocol, uh, I forget the full um, acronym, but uh, Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. There we go. If we wanted to use that for additional security, we could. We could simply click the plus sign here, and we could set up our CHAP username and password. And if we wanted to use mutual CHAP, we could do that as well. But in this case, we're just going to leave it open because we're using an initiator group, and that is enough security for us in this case. Okay, so we have some additional things down here. So once an actual client or an initiator connects, makes a connection to our iSCSI target, it'll actually start showing up in our Houston UI here, which is really nice. You can keep track of all the clients that are accessing your iSCSI target. And not only that, but you can also see the reads and the writes that each client is doing, so you can keep track of how much I.O. a client is uh, sending or receiving on that iSCSI connection. So that gives us everything, but let's take a look under the hood at what this actually did, because if you recall, we're using PCS, Pacemaker, CoroSync, to handle all of this. So as we are going through and we are creating these, it's actually creating resources underneath the hood in Pacemaker. So if we do PCS status, 
we can see here. And I really went into detail on all of this in our previous HAI SCSI video that I did. So if you're really interested in, in understanding how all of these resources work and why it's so important that they're in the, the uh, order that they are, definitely check out that video. There's a lot of good information. But we can see that we have our resource group specifically for our IQN. If we had multiple uh, targets that we wanted to create on one server, we would have a resource group for each one of them. So it's, it's very nice and it can keep them all completely separated for you. So we can see we have a port blocker on. This is going to block the port when it fails over. Again, if you want to know more about that, check the video. We've got our VIP. We've got our LUN. We've got our target. Um, and then we've got the actual LV, or sorry, we have the LV, the LVM resource. We've got the target, and then we have the actual iSCSI LUN uh, resource. And then finally, we have another port block, but this one's port block off. So it just port block on starts, port block off ends it. And then underneath, we can see all of our RBDs here. So that is our pacemaker resource group, and that is how things are going to move from host to host if we ever had to do a failover scenario. All right. so. Without further ado, let's now connect to our iSCSI target through my initiator on my machine. So if we go back to file sharing, we can see our IQN is 6.20. So let's pop in to my iSCSI initiator here and let's try to connect to it. So let's go 192.168.6.20, quick connect. And look at that. We can see we are already connected to the 45 drives test iSCSI. Click done. And now let's pop open disk manager. All right, so we now see a brand new disk pops up and we can see it is one Tebby byte in size. And it is now ready to be used, ready to put a file system on it and be accessed from this client. But let's take a look at what failover looks like. We've already done some pretty cool video uh, on my previous video on this, but let's just do it and let's see what happens live in this configuration. So what we're going to do, first things first, is we're going to do PCS node standby. So we can see that everything is started on 10.10.10.51, which is this host right here. We've got 10.10.10.52 is the other host. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand by the active host and all these resources are going to fail over to the other side and there's going to be no downtime and the client won't even know that anything happened. So let's go 10.10.10.51 and we can watch this in real time. We can see it stopped the resources. It's starting everything right now on 10, 10, 10, 52, and it's already done. We can see everything is now failed over to 10, 10, 10, 52. And one more time, everything's working, and let's hop over to our client, and let's take a look here, connect it, and there's our disk right there. So let's make a volume on it, mount it, and it's formatting. All right, and so we are now formatted. And if we head up to this PC, there's our new disk. And we're ready to rock. Okay, so that was our iSCSI module in a nutshell. We can actually see here our current initiator mapped. And we can see we've got a little bit of reads and writes here, but nothing too crazy, of course, because we haven't actually put any IO on it. That was from the formatting process of the LUN uh, with NTFS. Okay, so that's it. Now, if you guys are interested in checking this out, you can pick this up today, like I said, and you check it out at 45drives.repo.com. All of the modules that you'll need to install are on there. So the package you're wanna, gonna wanna get is called cockpit-file-sharing and that will install everything you need. You're also gonna need Cockpit itself installed, so make sure that you have Houston and Cockpit, all the modules installed. Um, I'll leave a link to a guide to get everything installed down below so you can check it out without any issue. All right, thanks for stopping by and watching this quick little run through of the new iSCSI module for the Houston UI. If you have any questions, any comments, definitely leave them down below and we're always in there checking out and, and answering anything that we can. Um, also, if you want any videos that you're interested in seeing, let us know, give us some ideas for sure because we're always looking for new ideas for videos. All right, I'll see you on the next one, guys.